Good morning everybody and welcome to our Sunday service and especially warm welcome if this is your first time with us. It's wonderful to have you worshipping with us online today. Let me tell you what's coming up in today's service. After our notices, Alison Harvey is going to bring us our Bible readings. I'm going to be leading our prayers and our licensed lay reader, Carol Unwin, is going to be preaching for us. Uh, we'll link it all together with our usual selection of hymns for you to enjoy. Here's what's happening then this weekend. And we're going Harvest Festival mad, uh, starting with Breakfast Church in Upton at half past nine, uh, where we'll be celebrating God's wonderful provision with added bacon rolls. At the same time, there's a harvest service in Hanley Swan at half past nine. And then at 11 o'clock, there are harvest services at The Hook and Strensham. And we round a day of harvest festivals off with a harvest festival even song at Hanley Castle. Uh, then on Thursday this coming week, there's a communion service in Upton at 10 o'clock. It's almost worth saying that isn't a Harvest Festival service. Um, and then next weekend, there are services at Hanley Castle at 8 o'clock and Upton at half past nine. And then at 11 o'clock, there are services at Earl's Croom and Welland. And I have a hunch they're Harvest Festivals too. And of course, we have our annual Sealed Knot celebration service at 11 o'clock in Ripple. If that's not something you've ever been to and you wonder if you're invited, yes you are. It's not just for Sealed Knot members. Anybody who fancies some Civil War reenactment, pageantry, history, as well as a simple sermon, some great hymn singing and all the usual things we would have in our services, you're very welcome to pop along to the Sealed Knot service at 11 o'clock at Ripple next weekend. For more information on our services and everything else that's going on in Upton and the surrounding parishes at the moment, do check our newsletter and the website calendar page, hopechurchfamily.org forward slash calendar. Now, in a few moments, we're going to sing our opening song. First, I'd like to remind you about our online collection. Many of you already give regularly to our churches, um, but if you don't and would like to, or you'd like to give a one-off gift to help the work we do in this tricky time, then do please visit our online giving page, hopechurchfamily.org forward slash giving, where you can choose which of our parish churches you'd like to support and also find contact details for our treasurers. We're very grateful for everything that everyone gives. And whether it's a lot or a little, the important thing is that you are comfortable and happy with what you give. For the Bible tells us the Lord loves a cheerful giver. Give out of your generosity. Shall we quieten our hearts and then let's open ourselves up to meeting with the Lord in worship? Why don't you respond to these prayers and phrases and worship acclamations by saying out the bits in bold. O Lord, open our lips and our mouth shall proclaim your praise. Bless the Lord, all you works of the Lord. Sing his praise and exalt him forever. Bless the Lord, you heavens. Sing his praise and exalt him forever. Bless the Lord, you angels of the Lord. Sing his praise and exalt him forever. Bless the Lord, all people on earth. Sing his praise and exalt him forever. O people of God, bless the Lord. Sing his praise and exalt him forever. Bless the Lord, you priests of the Lord. Sing his praise and exalt him forever. Bless the Lord, you servants of the Lord. Sing his praise and exalt him forever. Bless the Lord, all you of upright spirit. Bless the Lord, you that are holy and humble in heart. Bless the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit. Sing his praise and exalt him forever. Well, our theme this morning is God's amazing plan for everything, which rather might surprise you, includes the church. It's all about the relationship between Jesus and his church. And we're going to sing of that now as we stand, if you wish, and sing, The Church's One Foundation is Jesus Christ, her Lord.
brothers and sisters, the Holy Scripture calls us in various places to acknowledge and confess our many sins and wickedness, and that we shouldn't try to hide them before the face of Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, but confess them with a humble, lowly, penitent and obedient heart, so that we may obtain forgiveness of them by his infinite goodness and mercy. And although we ought at all times humbly to acknowledge our sins before God, we ought to do so especially when we assemble and come together to give thanks for his great blessings that we've received at his hands, to offer the praise that is due to him, to hear his most holy word and to ask him to supply our needs of body and soul. Therefore I ask and call you all to approach the throne of heavenly grace with me, humbly and with pure intent, saying, Almighty and most merciful Father, we have erred and strayed from your ways like lost sheep. We have followed too much the evil intentions and desires of our own hearts. We have broken your holy laws. We have left undone what we ought to have done, and we have done what we ought not to have done, and thus there is no wholeness within us. Lord, have mercy on us, pitiful sinners. Spare those who confess their sins. Restore those who truly repent, even as you have promised, through Jesus Christ our Lord. And grant, merciful Father, for his sake, that we may live hereafter a godly, righteous and holy life, to the glory of your name. Amen. And may Almighty God, who forgives all who truly repent, have mercy upon us, pardon and deliver us from all our sins, confirm and strengthen us in all goodness, and keep us in life eternal, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And now here's Alison with our first reading. Our reading is taken from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 10, beginning at verse 2. Jesus then left that place and went into the region of Judea and across the Jordan. Again the crowds of people came to him, and as was his custom, he taught them. Some Pharisees came and tested him by asking, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? What did Moses command you? he replied. They said, Moses permitted a man to write a certificate of divorce and send her away. It was because your hearts were hard that Moses wrote you this law, Jesus replied. But at the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. When they were in the house again, the disciples asked Jesus about this. He answered, anyone who divorces his wife and marries another woman commits adultery against her. And if she divorces her husband and marries another man, she commits adultery. People were bringing their little children to Jesus for him to place his hands on them, but the disciples rebuked them. When Jesus saw this, he was indignant. He said to them, let the little children come to me and do not hinder them, for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. Truly, I tell you, anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God like a little child will never enter it. And he took the children in his arms, placed his hands on them and blessed them. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you for reading that for us, Alison. I love the way Jesus answers the most challenging ethical question of his day by reaching all the way back to try to understand God's original intentions, that he made us male and female, and he made male and female together for lifelong marriage. That was all part of God's plan and purpose. And yet we also know that we don't live up to that plan sometimes, do we? So our next song is thanking the Lord for his kindness in sending Jesus for the times when it goes wrong, in lavishing his kindness and grace and mercy upon us. So why don't we stand if you wish and we'll sing This Is Amazing Grace. This is amazing grace This is unfailing love That you would take my place 
that you would bear my cross you would lay down your life that I would be set free oh Jesus I sing for all that you've done for me Who breaks the power? Who breaks the power of sin and darkness? Whose love is mighty and so much stronger? The King of glory, the King above all kings. Who shakes the whole earth with holy thunder and leaves us breathless? In awe and wonder, the King of glory, the King above all kings. Only you, this is amazing grace. This is unfailing love. That you would take my place. That you would bear my cross. You would lay down your life. That I would be set free Oh, Jesus, I sing for All that you've done for me Who brings our chaos Back into order Who makes the orphan A son and daughter the King of glory, the King above all kings. Who rules the nations with truth and justice, shines like the sun in all of His brilliance. The King of glory, the King above all kings. Tell me, Jesus, this is amazing grace. This is unfailing love That you would take my place That you would bear my cross You would lay down your life That I would be set free Oh, Jesus, I sing going to be bringing us our sermon but first here's Alison again with our second reading
Our reading is taken from St. Paul's letter to the Ephesians church, chapter three, beginning at verse 11. For this reason, I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, for the sake of you Gentiles. Surely you have heard about the administration of God's grace that was given to me for you. That is the mystery made known to me by revelation, as I've already written briefly. In reading this then, you will be able to understand my insight into the mystery of Christ, which was not made known to people in other generations as it has now been revealed by the Spirit to God's holy apostles and prophets. This mystery is that through the gospel, the Gentiles are heirs together with Israel, members together of one body and sharers together in a promise in Christ Jesus. I became a servant of this gospel by the gift of God's grace given me through the working of his power. Although I am less than the least of all the Lord's people, this grace was given to me to preach to the Gentiles the boundless riches of Christ and to make plain to everyone the administration of this mystery, which for ages past was kept hidden in God, who created all things. His intent was that now, through the church, the manifold wisdom of God should be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms, according to his eternal purpose he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. In him and through faith in him, we may approach God with freedom and confidence. I ask you, therefore, not to be discouraged because of my sufferings for you, which are your glory. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, welcome everyone. I'm Carol. I'm one of the leaders here. Good to have you with us this morning. And we've got an amazing passage. I'm going to trip over this, so <laughs> be ready to laugh. Got an amazing passage this morning that Maple's just read to us. And I guess in a way, it's about confidence. We're thinking about confidence this morning. Are you a confident person, would you say? Go back, right, yeah. Would you say you're a confident person? Yes, no. Maybe in some settings you are, maybe in others you aren't. I don't know, that's what I sort of feel like, I guess. In some areas I feel really confident, like my job or professionally, um, but other areas maybe I'm not so confident. Um, now, it's not British as well, is it, to be that confident? We don't like it if people appear too confident. Um, results day, we've heard. Now, Maple, she did really, really well in her results, but I remember days when I would hear... Look, mum, I just need to tell you, right, I'm probably going to fail my Spanish. <laughs> and other parents will probably identify with that. Sorry to embarrass her. But obviously, yeah, she was, there were some days she didn't feel that confident. And all of us, when we got exams, some days we don't feel confident, do we? Now, to help me, and I know sometimes women aren't known for being as confident as they should be in the workplace. Um, to help me, I have this mug. I love this mug. You'll have seen them in loads of the cute shops. Um, I like it. Remember, you are braver than you believe, stronger than you feel, and smarter than you think, you know? And uh, <laughs> that helps me, and I think, it's, I think it's true. I believe it's true, and it's a good reminder, you know, positive thinking, and that's human wisdom. But this morning, we're looking at God's wisdom, I guess. God's wisdom. What would God have on his mug? And that's some of what's in our passage. I'm just going to pray before we start. Let's pray. Dear Jesus, we welcome you here this morning. Thank you that you're here by your spirit. We are gathered as your church, your holy, royal church. We exalt you. You're enthroned in heaven above all powers and all authorities. And we're connected to you through our union with you as we've invited you into our lives. Um, we thank you, Jesus. Help open our minds today to what you want us to hear from you exactly for us this morning um, and encourage us all together. Amen. Amen. Right, well, I've got a couple of questions for you to start with. Let's try this. There we go. So, um, if you were to think of who approaches God with freedom and confidence, okay, um, you, in your mind, you might just be thinking of people who, in your mind, might be approaching God with freedom and confidence. You know, just talking freely to God day by day, just like a direct hotline to God. <laughs> who would you think? 
Spider-Man, <laughs> the Pope, maybe your nan at the top. That's meant to be, say, you know, often some of us have nans who took us to Sunday school. Um, these two here, they're John and Anne Coles. They uh, set up New Wine. They led a big church in London. I um, got to know them. Me and Barry got to know them a bit. Really sort of godly people, um, amazing things and using gifts of the Spirit. So a church leader maybe you saw or a speaker you heard or video, a speaker or whatever. Um, the top, that's, you know, just maybe, again, at a conference or something, a big speaker, you would think, oh, they, they must have a hotline to God. They seem so confident. Yeah, so just have a think yourself. I'm not going to ask you. Who would it be? And then question two, I guess, is what stops you approaching God with freedom and confidence, or maybe more freedom and confidence, if you already would feel you are fairly confident. What stops you approaching God with freedom and confidence? Do you think, well, I don't have the right family history. You know, my family weren't religious enough. I'm not from a church background, so I just feel a bit on the outside. Do you think... Well, I don't have enough understanding of the special book, the Bible. Do you think, you know what, I don't keep enough of the rules that Christians are meant to keep. I'm not morally good enough, so I don't really feel that confident in my relationship with God. Do you think, I'm not sure I fit in really to the group of people. I'm different. I always feel a bit on the outside and not totally accepted. Or do you think, maybe when I'm an adult, then I might feel a bit more confident to talk to God more, yeah? So have a think in your own mind. What is it that stops you? Maybe it's one of those reasons or it might be a different one. But if you even slightly think any of those reasons, well, two things. One, that's exactly the same as the audience of Paul's letter, the readers and the church in Ephesus, they were new Christians and they felt like that, all those reasons. And two, all those reasons are exactly what I felt like when I was at Keswick Convention Conference last week, okay? Basically, the point is all of us, I think, have some of those reasons that make us stop thinking we can approach God with freedom and confidence. Um, and there's this one family we met. I mean, it's just in my head, I think. But, you know, they just seem so perfect. We trained with them at college. <laughs> Barry knows who I mean. They're just like the sort of golden couple. They're both just amazingly good looking and well turned out. And just their whole family. It's always together, you know, everything. Um, but obviously, little do I know. And actually, when I was talking to the wife, actually, she said she shared something and she was quite vulnerable. And, you know, she is sat quite sad about something that we could sort of connect about um, in terms of, we, you know, similar things and not everything's perfect. So it just goes to show, I think, what we might think isn't always true. Right. So I know anyway, I know from that, that God has a message for each of us here this morning, okay? Because he's writing to these new Christians in this church of Ephesus. Um, they're like traders and hipster dudes in this buzzing Greek commercial city, okay? And they're, they've come into knowledge through Paul of God of Israel. Well, that's a foreign country. That's not Greece. So they're a bit insecure, you know? How do they fit in to this religion of another country, Israel, the Jews? They're not Jews, they're Greeks. You know, they're a bit insecure, what's going on? How do they fit in? So we're going to be looking at that. But first, <laughs> anyone remembers this, this dates me, but who likes reality TV transformation programs, yes? Yeah? Anyone else like them? Maybe garden makeovers? Or fashion makeovers, or property makeovers, yeah? Yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah, they're, I mean, they're great, they're great. This one was an old one, what not to wear, Trini and Susanna. Gosh, where are they now when you need them? I don't know. Anyway, but <laughs> my favorite, <laughs> they could help me out, I'm sure. My favorite one is this one, okay. Who likes this, DIY SOS, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I love this, okay, with Nick and Billy, and it's great, it's amazing, and they have, obviously, 
they have the big reveal, don't they, in these programs. And it starts off, I mean, there's so many aspects. There's all the banter between the crew, and it starts off with the tearjerker story of a tragic situation which these guys have to sort of rock up and also gather the community too in a wonderful team effort to transform this family's life. And there's the messy demolition of old structures, isn't there? And then the tension between the designer's ideas and then the construction people who don't really get it and what's this wacky designer doing? And then the new structures are built. And then at the end, you get the big reveal of the family being brought in. You've got to close their eyes um, before they open them to see all these glossy new structures, new rooms, shiny surfaces, and then those personal photos as well they do. It's oh, so touching and it's wonderful. And then as well, the community get to see the big reveal too. And at the end of the day, the manifold wisdom of the designer is triumphantly displayed and applauded and I guess being a designer myself then yeah I love that too and everybody <laughs> most people love what this design has done and it's all amazing well that's a great illustration really of what we have today because we have God's big reveal okay this is his big reveal of his new home on earth it's so cool and how does he display it who does he get to present it a normal human guy Paul a normal human guy who God has put his wisdom into. And God's big reveal, the new home and dwelling place of God on earth, the spiritual body of Christ now on earth, and the wisdom of creator God of the universe displayed and made known to all the rulers and powers in the spiritual realms, which we don't even know about, okay? We only glimpse... We don't know what's going on totally in the spiritual realm, but here, Paul pulls back the curtain a bit. God lets us glimpse into his intent, his motivation, his personal intent for the universe and what's going on. And the church, this new reality, this shiny surface thing is like a diamond, I imagined it. Um, and the text sort of bears that out. Manifold wisdom of God, this multifaceted, sparkling, glistening, diamond of the church that just I don't know it's like a victory flag in the universe in the spiritual realms to all rulers all other powers who array their dark powers against God and it's amazing it's beautiful the wonderful new possible triumphantly displayed um and yeah, <laughs> it's exciting. And Paul, and again, I don't know if you picked this out from how Maple read it, but there's loads in there about his personal cause, isn't there? You know, there's lots going on in his life as such, although he's so humble, he doesn't really make that the main point. But he has the privilege, he puts it in a way, of literally pouring himself out for this cause. Um, he once tried to squash this church and kill Christians, but now Jesus appeared to him and suddenly, yeah, he's doing what Jesus commands. And there's three things um, I want us to hear from God today uh, about the church, okay? Three things. First, um, the church together, together, together. I don't know if you spotted that. It's really exciting. Verse 6. Together, 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 the church. This is radical stuff in that day and this day, actually. This mystery is that through the gospel, the Gentiles are heirs together with Israel, members together of one body, and sharers together in the promise of Christ Jesus. Now, that the Gentiles, so in Jewish history in the Old Testament, Egyptian, BC times, that the, uh, that the Gentiles, non-Jews, would eventually like repent or turn also to the God of Israel. That was sort of expected, that, that was prophesied. But that the Gentiles would come into a, an organic unity with the Jews on an equal footing was totally unexpected, okay? And the Jews, obviously, they're God's special nation. They've got very proud of that, a lot of them. That non-Jews, that pagans, would suddenly be able to have all the benefits 
of Israel and all the promises of the Old Testament and access to their special God. No, that's, you know, <laughs> that was totally unexpected. And that is the mystery that Paul has been told to reveal to um, to the world, basically. And it was revealed not just to Paul, but the apostles. So he's not some wacky David Icke bloke who just got a vision suddenly. Uh, it was also revealed to the 12 apostles too, and they sent him out. And he set up churches all across Europe. Together, together, together. Now that's like... That's like saying to Newcastle and Sunderland, like if someone said, <laughs> you know what, let's just have one football team in the northeast, you know. <laughs> you know, we'll just get rid of Newcastle and Sunderland, we'll just have one. Would that be all right, Barry, Peter? Go for that? <laughs> ah, yeah. <laughs> or like Cheltenham and Gloucester, you know. If they just said, let's just, we'll just have one team. Um, <laughs> so, you know incredible stuff how on earth is that going to work it's impossible uh, or like northern ireland the two communities there now you know for them just if you say oh look just together 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 come on just together 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 all right we're all together difficult difficult so the gentiles are heirs together with israel and now Jews have all the same blessings the Jews did. And through knowing Jesus, everyone gets to inherit all God's riches, all of heaven for eternity. So it doesn't matter if you have a family history of being religious, basically. That's what Paul's saying to these Greek new Christians. It doesn't matter if you don't have that heritage of being religious to the God of Israel. That doesn't matter now. Secondly, all people are members together of Jesus. So it's like a finger and a foot. So, you know, for the Jews, again, it's like, no, it's this one new entity. So we're all members. So um, you can't now think it doesn't matter whether you feel you fit in or not. It's irrelevant because you're operational. If you know Jesus, it doesn't matter if you feel like you fit in. So I need to learn from that as well. Because sometimes when I feel I don't fit in in places, I find it's actually a bit of sort of selfishness really, or fear, isn't it? And it can just certainly stop me then getting to know people properly. So it's not really that good. And the third part of that verse, everybody shares, share together, you know, lovely. Everyone shares together, all the Jews and um, non-Jews now share. They once had all these rules to keep them apart, but they now share. And in Northern Ireland, again, we know there was like a huge amount of effort, wasn't there, put in um, so that under certain situations with loads of written agreements within carefully defined terms, um, the two, two parts of Northern Ireland can work together and have the benefit of power sharing. And that's wonderful, and we know it's wonderful. And in, I think in Israel, isn't it, they're going to do like a coalition of five different parties or something, and at least two, three different religions. So that's special too. But God's big reveal called the church, everybody, every different type of person can come together. You know, Jews, Gentiles, slaves, free women, men, young, old, Brexiters, Remainers, vegetarians, meat eaters, you know, whatever the divide we put in, everybody, absolutely everybody, can not just work together for a certain time, no, but just be one, uh, love, care for each other, grow together, go in the same direction. So that is absolutely incredible, it's impossible, and that in itself, that special thing, that impossible thing that could only happen through God's power, that in itself is such a display of God's wisdom to the heavenly realms, spiritual realms. The second takeaway almost now, and I love that phrase, you've got that boundless riches. You know, oh, if I even think of the definition boundless riches, you want to be rich? This is God's boundless riches, okay? So everything that's important, unlimited. So very cool. We can now have boundless riches and can approach God with freedom and confidence as kings, okay? And I put that in there because apparently uh, in the original text, the Aramaic part of it sort of has this idea um, of sort of kings that we like because Jesus somehow, because he's king, now, he did his work on the cross, he's exalted 
victorious as king and we're connected to him. So somehow we have that kingly part to us. We're like kings. We have that royal aspect. We're his sons and daughters, I guess, sons and daughters of God. So we have that kingly aspect. So we can just walk in. We can just waltz in to God anytime, say, you know, God, I'm really worried about one of my kids at school today. Please help them. God, you know, I really want to tell someone about you. Um, Please help them. Or God, I know someone's suffering. I don't know how to help them. What should I do? Should I give them a gift? Should I ring them up? Tell me what should I do? So anything, any time of day, we can just waltz in and ask God with freedom of confidence. And we can also use his power too. We can, it's available to us, to our hands, to our mouths, his power of heaven. The whole power of heaven is in our hands, basically. Um, well, that reminds me of Take Me Out when he says the power. Anyway, <laughs> power is in our hands, okay? So, you know, do we just need to ask God, please heal that person? He might not always do it if it's not in his will, but we can at least ask. Help that person. Let me share your love with that person. Let me share your message with that person. So we got the whole power of heaven in our hands, basically. Incredible. Um, yeah. So don't be waiting. <laughs> don't be waiting. Now we can just use it. Um, I ask you at the start, what stops you approaching God with freedom and confidence? But I hope you can see that nothing need stop us. There's nothing that needs stop us just approaching God with freedom of confidence. That's what Paul's wanting us to know. Now, last point, three, the church, this incredible thing in the passage about the heavenly realms, somehow in God's intention, the church stands in the heavenly realms to display God's wisdom. And there's something special about that, okay, that we don't fully No, so I have to just read out this bit from the study Bible because it puts it far better than I can do. Somehow, the um, yeah, the church as meeting together is basically more impactful than we can really know or realize. Here's the quote, right. In Christ Jesus, now being enthroned in heaven and in Christians being united in the exalted King Jesus, ultimate issues are involved, issues that pertain to the divine realm and that in the final analysis are worked out in and from that realm, okay? So there's stuff going on in the spiritual realm that we don't really know about, but um, the church is basically really important in that. And I, okay, this is a bit embarrassing, but I thought it would help if I drew a picture, okay? But I didn't have time to redo it, so <laughs> you've got my back of the envelope sketch here, okay? So. I apologize for the scribble, (laughs) but hopefully something in it is useful of the landscape of how the Bible describes the earthly and heavenly realms. So we'll see. We'll finish off on this. Okay, look, there you go. (laughs) Very (laughs) scribbling. Okay, (laughs) I'll try. So at the top there is Jesus enthroned with a crown, okay? And that is because he did the work. He was obedient to God faithfully totally and through the cross so God has now exalted him to the highest place above all other up there and then again the Bible talks about in his victory procession in his train he carried lots of people he carried captives he carried us who were captive to sin and now freed from sin so anyway and we know we're connected to Christ now he comes into us so we you can see that bit of a line connecting us <laughs> to Jesus. And then we, through that, we have this little kingly aspect, this royal aspect. We're children of the king. God is our father now. And so the church stands there with the flag of Jesus. And because of the cross, thankfully, the dark powers, Satan, and that's not that's meant to be a lion in that cage, okay? <laughs> Because sometimes Satan is depicted, well, you can sort of imagine him like a chained lion or a caged lion. Someone said that to me and it sort of helped me in that he has power in this world and there's lots of evil going on in this world and yeah, all around us. But actually, we don't need to fear it because Jesus has won the victory on the cross and the cross basically is what, well, Satan knows he's beaten. He's just got this time when he can still operate, okay? 
But in some way, I don't know if that helps, but in some way you can see that Paul, here in this passage, is wanting to communicate that the church is really special. When we gather, we're gathering now to worship God. And spiritually, this is huge impact, okay? So evil powers will flee and everything like that. So just to make us aware as well of, um, yeah, just to make us aware of that earthly spiritual realm. And so remember, when we just might feel... Um, oh, I'm not good enough to talk to God, or oh, I won't bother because I'm busy. It's not just about us, but actually Satan might be just putting those thoughts in our head to stop us, and we need to fight against that. We need to say, no, I will talk to God about it, you know. So it's not just about us, but there's a whole spiritual realm there that together we can support each other, stick together, and declare Jesus as Lord and evil will flee around us, and we can use his power to get rid of bad things and redeem stuff in God's will. So I hope that's helpful. I'm helpful. I'm just going to sum up. So for this week, let's be confident in God's wisdom. Let's not give ourselves any more excuses for not approaching God with freedom and confidence. Just talk with him. We can just talk with him as his special royal children and lean on his help and power. Let's not Satan deceive us with stupid fake news reasons that um, we have believed for not talking easily to our Heavenly Father and our King and Brother Jesus and not using their power. When we can, we have it. And let's step up like Paul to our role as Christ's body on earth, his hands and his feet with his power available to our mouths, to our hands and our hearts, as we just seek to do what Jesus did. You get those little bracelets, can't you? To remind you, um, do what Jesus did or whatever. Um, So I'm going to just pray now. And uh, yeah, let's pray. Jesus, we thank you that we're here today. We thank you for bringing us here. Thank you for all you've done in our lives. And however much or however little we know about you, however much or little we feel um, included in your church, I pray that today you may just transform all of that. You may just move us each on in confidence and in freedom in using your power on earth to do your work. Wherever we are, in our lives, our place of work, our families, people we meet, you may give us more freedom, more confidence to use your power for your glory and everyone's benefit as we seek to do your work on this earth. In Jesus' name. Amen. Well, Carol shared something of God's big picture of creation there and the church's role in it. So let's celebrate our creator God now as we sing Immortal, Invisible, God, Only Wise. And why don't you stand for this if you wish.
let's remain standing as we declare our faith using the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and he is seated at the right hand of the Father and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body and the life everlasting. Amen. Now do please take a seat and we're going to carry on responding to the Lord in prayer. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, thank you for all of the blessings we receive from you. Most of all, the blessing of relationship with you made possible through Jesus' death upon the cross. Thank you for the love that you showed for us there in sending him to be our rescuer. And we pray for the work of the church around the world in trying to share the good news of reconciliation with you through Jesus. Bless the mission of the church, Lord. May we be a people who experience growth and revival in our day. Bless our churches locally with that, that we might reach out in making new disciples for you as you have called us to do. We pray for new initiatives across our nation, for the Church of England as it wrestles competing bodies and politics and challenges that will draw it away from its core mission to proclaim you. May our leaders, our bishops, those representing us, our General Synod, seek first of all to put evangelism upon the menu rather than any other distraction. Build your church. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for our brothers and sisters around the world, many of whom are facing persecution. Lord, we think of a, a Christian merchant today called Yemenu, living in southern Ethiopia. Father, you know him, you know his family, you know the church that he's part of and how they have been targeted by Muslim mobs through the last 12 months. We pray, Lord, as he recovers from having his home and his business destroyed. We pray that you would help them to rebuild their lives. Thank you for keeping them safe through the terrible fire that followed the attack. And we pray that he would not feel abandoned or forgotten despite his circumstances. Grant him opportunities to earn money to support his family as they rebuild their lives. And Lord, we think of our brothers and sisters in other parts of the world as well. We think of Afghanistan particularly, Lord, that you would give courage to the Christians there, protect them from harm and help them to carry on sharing that life-giving news of Jesus. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for our nation, that you would guide our Queen and all who govern in her name. Pray for good government that would benefit all and that our government might have the wisdom best to know how to face each and every challenge it encounters. We pray for local councillors and for various agencies within our community, particularly we think of our schools this week. Protect them from COVID, give wisdom to all who must take decisions and provide resources for those schools, Lord, we pray. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for all those struggling with illness at this time, especially we remember Melanie Wood, Alan Godby, Ken Follett, Ruth Groom, Margaret Lithgow, Hazel Parsons, Renee Dowson, Robert England, Simon Barclay, Mary Purser, Catherine Griffin, Julian Hart, Pam Morton, Jean Trevor Morgan, Jennifer Unwin and Betty. Lord, we pray for healing. We pray for patience within those people. Good skill among those who are giving them counsel and care. And Lord, if it be your will, bring them to recovery. We pray also for those struggling with grief and bereavement at this moment, particularly the family and friends of Chris Taylor, Chris Day and Mark Tomini and anyone else who has been bereaved in this last week. May they know the comfort that you can provide in the face of grief. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. And let's continue in prayer as we pray the Church's special prayer for this week. And why don't we say this together? Almighty and everlasting God, Increase in us your gift of faith, that forsaking what lies behind and reaching out to that which is before, 
we may run the way of your commandments and win the crown of everlasting joy. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. And as our Saviour has taught us, so we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Well, before we sing our final hymn, here's a brief message from Alison Maddox, who's our Dean of Smaller Churches. A phrase from a film I watched this week really stuck with me. One character said to another, something needs to change. Now go find it. I love that. There is a sense in so many of our churches that something needs to change. And what I really love is the sense of starting on a quest to seek what needs to be rather than focusing on what might be wrong. And finding what needs to be means listening to God through prayer and through seeking out his voice in all that's happening around us. If we step out in faith into our community with the question, what's supposed to happen around here? We may well find that God answers our question in the most unexpected of ways through the voice of the most surprising of people. The answer to the future of the church always lies outside the church. The church is there to serve people especially those who've not yet discovered the power of the Spirit in their lives. That doesn't mean the Spirit's not at work in their lives. The Spirit is at work in the life of everyone. It means that they've not yet recognised or named the Spirit and thus are not responding to its prompting. Our future as a church may lie with people who we've not yet either met or found a way to love. Our future as a church may lie in joining with the initiative of others. Our future as a church will lie in praying for the people around us. To do this well, we need to know them and their cares. Anything God wants us to do, we will have the means to do, not necessarily on our own, but together with others. Our priorities may not be God's priorities, if it all feels like a struggle, maybe it's time to ask ourselves, are we doing the right things? Something needs to change. Go find it and have fun on the way. Thanks for that, Alison. We're going to finish our time together this morning by fixing our eyes on Jesus as we stand, if we feel able, and sing in Christ alone. singing to him, we're meeting with him, we're not just singing about him, let's meet with him as we sing this. In Christ alone, my hope is found, he is my light, my strength, my soul, this cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace When fears are still, when striving cease My comforter, my all in all Here in the love of Christ I stand In Christ alone 
Thanks for joining us for worship today. Do please invite others to join us as we worship online week by week. If this has been your first time with us, I hope you've enjoyed it. We'll be here same time next week. We're also meeting in person in our churches together now. And because we're able to sing together at last, it's a wonderful feeling at the moment. Do come along and add your voice to the chorus if you feel ready to return. If there's any way we can help you in your spiritual journey during these unusual times, do please get in touch with me, barry at hopechurchfamily.org. And so, may the Lord bless us and preserve us from all evil and keep us in eternal life. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. And why don't we finish with the words of the grace. <laughs> may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Amen.